At around 6 p.m. Patrick Dunn got home on Wednesday after working an extra hour and a half to finish a wiring job that his boss, Wayne Falk, had given him earlier that day. Because he was so dedicated, he finished the job almost half a day early, even though he worked nonstop all day and got sore muscles. His wife Glenda had left that morning for a three-day conference in Columbus, so he could focus on his work. At first, he was going to go with her, but they had already booked a cruise for spring break, and the tickets were clearly visible in their china cupboard. Patrick chose to call Glenda because he wasn't expecting a message confirming that she had arrived safely. From their house phone, he called her cell phone. She answered it after only two rings and told him she was happy to hear from him and that she was about to call him herself. Patrick wasn't surprised that she knew it was him calling because his number was shown on her home phone. Since I've always been able to read your mind, honey, I think you made it there safely. How are the roads? Want to make sure your car is still whole? He laughed, ready for her to defend her driving skills and picturing the angry look on her face. He thought she'd stick her tongue out if they were in real life. The thought of snow falling in early January made him a little nervous. Her driving would make him happy. He felt better when she replied quickly, if she flew. She made him laugh and told him everything was okay. Traffic wasn't bad, and the map he printed out made it easy for her to find the Sheraton Hotel. Do whatever you need me to do for you, sweetheart. He said that my Glenda could have anything. He asked to take the day off to go with her, but she said no right away. She told him strongly, no, you're not coming. She then told him why she wanted to wait until spring break to go on a trip with him. Yeah, I know, I was just joking, Glenda, he told her, even though her hard rejection made him feel bad. He laughed and told her, I'll be a good boy and stay home. He wasn't going to let her get away with it so easy. He could tell she was feeling better when she said, glad to hear it, Patrick. With classes all set up, the next few days will be pretty dull. Actually, we wouldn't have time for each other. Oh, Glenda, do you think I can read your mind? Wanna talk? You made me remember. I unfortunately cannot locate my journey bag containing my sewing kit and other items. The bedroom or the trunk of the car might be where it is. No problem, honey. Allow me to retrieve the cordless. The bag was on the table when he ran upstairs. I found it, he said on the phone. Be careful with the Linton buttons. With a sigh of relief, she mentioned a store close where she could get new ones. Have to go. You can now register. Thursday through Saturday we'll be busy with meals and presentations, but we'll spend Saturday night together. Don't worry, chick. Additional work was done today. It should work out for Thursday and Friday. Contact me by phone if you can. The same thing will be done by me if something comes up. Looking forward to dinner with you on Saturday. After sharing pleasantries, Patrick went downstairs to think about how Glenda had been acting lately. Even though she laughed off his joke about going on her trip, she had been acting strangely for months. So he could eat while being busy, he ordered pizza. He took off his work clothes and sat down with a beer at the kitchen table with almost 40 minutes to go until the delivery. His job kept him busy, so he didn't have to worry about being overweight. Even though Glenda didn't like pizza, he ate it anyway. You could easily reheat the leftovers at work for lunch tomorrow. He watched a news show on TV for an hour, but his mind kept going back to Glenda and how she had changed recently. He felt bad that she strongly didn't want him to go on her trip with her. Glenda, who was 35 years old and a sociology professor, was tall, thin, and had long, dark hair and eyes. She said she had more classes than other junior faculty members because she was proud of how well she was doing and that she had a teaching assistant to help her with marking and giving advice. When the fall term started, she talked about her TA, Anthony, a senior who was graduating and who took on some of her duties. His name came up sometimes, but not recently. In the middle of November, she told him about planned seminars over the New Year break, and at first, she agreed to let him join. But she changed her mind after two weeks and now wants to go on a trip during spring break. He didn't want to, but he had to accept her choice. Seminars weren't talked about over Christmas because they were spending time with family and friends. When Glenda got the training papers in an envelope, she quickly sent back her registration. She started packing days before New Year's Eve because she was so excited to go on vacation. Her organized personality came through. He was going to read a book that was left on the bedside table again when he got back to the bedroom after 8 o'clock. He moved Glenda's bag to where it usually went in the closet when he saw that it was sitting on top of her notebook. His wife kept her book hidden for eight years, so he rarely saw it. He joked that he could read it, but she flatly refused, saying it was private and personal. 
In the eight years they were together, they never talked about it again, and he had only caught a glimpse of it a few times before she quickly put it away. Patrick thought Glenda might have written in her journal in her college office. He might have been at home while he was at work. Their plans did not match up. Usually, she was home when he left and back when he was done. He picked up the book again after putting the bag back in the closet. The six by eight inch book was wrapped in red leather and had a latch and brass lock to keep it shut. Patrick thought that the book might have information about how Glenda has been acting lately. He didn't put it back on the chest, instead, he took it downstairs to the kitchen, which was brighter. He looked it over carefully and saw that only a third of the pages showed signs of being used. This meant that it couldn't be her only diary with notes from eight years ago. There must be older books somewhere else. After some thought, Patrick decided that Glenda's closet was probably where her old notebooks were kept. Each of them had a room, but he had never looked in hers. After going upstairs and looking for five minutes, he finally found a shoebox on the top shelf that held a stack of red leather notebooks. He went back to the kitchen with what he had found. Notably, each diary had a small white number on the spine, from one to six. The present diary did not have a number on it. Each one had the name of a local specialty shop, Coombs, stamped on the back cover. There were no differences between the seven locks, they were all the same. Patrick thought maybe everyone used the same key. He quickly looked through the phone book and found Coombs' specialty number. It was almost 8.35, and he was wondering if they were still open. On Wednesdays, many shops downtown stayed open late. One of the calls was answered by a young woman who said, Coombs Specialties, how may I assist you? Her tone seemed real. Patrick asked about gift red leather notebooks that are about 6 inches by 8 inches. She stopped for about 3 minutes and said, I think I know the book you mean. Let me check. She made sure the store was open until 10 p.m. when she got back to make sure they had two in stock. Patrick hurried there in the hopes of finding a book and maybe even the key to open the locks. Even though the chances were low, Patrick knew that trying to open the locks would probably break them and get him in trouble with Glenda for a long time. Within 30 minutes, he was on his way home with a $60 red leather diary and key in his bag. It didn't bother him that much to find out what his wife was worried about. He thought about getting her the new book as a birthday present because he thought she might use it to hide her illness, like she did when she had an abnormal PAP test result in the past. He also thought about disagreements between college professors at work, even though he knew Glenda liked to handle these kinds of things on her own. Another thought that he found hard to get rid of was that Glenda might be having an affair. Instead of thinking about those possibilities, he focused on other possible causes. He was shorter and had blonde hair and blue eyes, while she was tall and thin. But they had known each other since high school and even dated for a short time. After high school, their paths split. Patrick became an apprentice electrician, while Glenda went to college. They got back together in college and got married right away after she graduated. After buying their home and Patrick becoming a master electrician, they planned to move to a bigger house and talked about starting a family. Glenda decided to stop taking birth control pills by the end of the school year. Patrick wasn't sure at home if the new journal's key would fit. It looked too small, but he found it in a small package in the diary box. He realized he should have asked the salesperson if the key would work with the machine. Instead of looking for Glenda's secret keys, he would give up if it didn't fit. He thought about whether to use the key on Glenda's most recent journal for five minutes while sitting at the kitchen table with a stack of diaries. Fear for her health and a strong desire to know more drove him on. He was unsure because he didn't want to break her trust. It didn't work, though, because the key fit exactly. He looked through the books and saw that Glenda's most recent writing, from the day before, took up most of the page. As he quickly read the neat writing on the page, tears started to form in his eyes and his face lost all color. He moved to the kitchen sink and accidentally squeezed his soda can, letting the soda spill out onto his arm. He finally cleaned up after himself and went to the living room with his notebook, eager to find out the truth about his wife and their life together that had broken his heart. Instead of reading backwards, he chose to read in order of events, trying to find answers. He almost confronted her at the hotel, but he didn't because he was afraid of losing and having an emotional breakdown. Patrick began his search for clues in Glenda's notebook with the first page, which was dated early June. She was happy with her life, job, and marriage, but Patrick kept looking for the page. But in early September, he found an important post that made him think of the answers he was looking for, so he read it twice. On September 8, Glenda wrote that she had met Anthony Romano, her new teaching helper. She said he was a little taller, had dark hair, dark eyes, and a short beard, and that he had a lot of good qualities. Patrick looked through the diary to see if Anthony was mentioned again, but there was nothing in the later notes. 
Just 100 people were there. Glenda wrote on September 15 that Anthony helped her with her big class by answering questions from the kids while she prepared for class. She noticed that her female students liked him and said that he reminded her of Leonardo DiCaprio. Patrick paid more attention to what he was reading because he kept coming across references to Anthony Romano. Glenda noticed on September 20 that students were watching her teach from the front row and planned to give him more work. When Anthony came to Glenda's office on September 24, she told him she was working on a reading project and he helped her quickly. She also said that she wanted to talk to Patrick about her plans for having children in the future. This was the first time that this subject had been brought up. On September 30, Glenda noticed Anthony's constant attention during class, even though she looked at him disapprovingly. In spite of this, Glenda was happy with how her students were doing and the stress she was under as a full professor. Later entries didn't talk about Anthony, but Glenda stayed positive about her classes and told Patrick she wanted to talk about family plans with him after her first year as a full professor. She planned to start trying to get pregnant at the end of the school year. Glenda told Anthony on October 8 how excited she was to start a family with Patrick after the spring term. She surprised him with a hug in her office, but she kindly reminded him that they were in public. Tuesday, October 10. Anthony locked Glenda's office door while he was visiting, which made her feel uncomfortable, but he did what she asked and unlocked it. After a short stay, she wasn't sure what he was up to. Saturday, October 11. Anthony went back to help Glenda and said he liked older women and was sorry for locking the door the day before. Even though he was happily married, he told her he liked her more than younger women at college. October 13, 2013. Anthony was supposed to come to Glenda's office, but he didn't. She was upset because she wanted to talk to him more about his interest in older women. October 15. She hoped Anthony would stay after the kids left her office, but he left before they could talk more. Friday, October 16. Finally, Glenda talked to Anthony and told him about her experiences. She felt bad that she didn't set clear limits and didn't condemn his behavior. The experience is still haunting her. When Patrick read this entry, he realized that Glenda didn't respond the way he thought she would. After getting a new can of soda, he left the book open and went back to read more about what was going on with Anthony. Tuesday, October 20. Anthony went into Glenda's office without warning right before he left for work, even though she had asked him to leave the door open. He admitted that his birthday had been on his mind. Because she didn't trust him, Glenda agreed to get rid of him. She later found out that his birthday was in July. She felt cheated, but she laughed it off. She is afraid of what he might be up to and decides to be careful around him. Anthony isn't in the next entries because Glenda is busy marking tests and writings. Anthony's lack of participation seems odd to Patrick, but the log doesn't give a reason. Halloween, October 30th. Something happened today that made him lock the door behind him and pull me toward him without giving me a chance to say no. Shameful that I didn't stop him sooner. He said I liked it when I finally pushed him away. At my request, he smiled and said he'd see me tomorrow. Taking care of Anthony's situation is hard for me. I'm stuck and don't know if I should tell Patrick what's on my mind. Additionally, I am unable to remove thoughts of Anthony from my mind. November 2nd. I no longer worried that Patrick would notice anything strange. The first night was rough, but he didn't think anything was wrong, even though I was scared. I learned how simple it is to hide things from him. November 11th. Recently, Anthony and I have not been alone for days. I don't like how he looks at me even when we're in class. I don't know what I'll do if he comes back to my office. I didn't like how he kissed me quickly before going. Still, I'm thinking about going to a set of seminars in Columbus after the new year. Friday, November 9th. It was hard to remember yesterday either. The way Anthony acts keeps bothering me, and I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't do something soon. Even though I was trying to concentrate on my work, Anthony got into my office without me noticing. I paused before giving in briefly when he tried to kiss me. I hid in the bathroom because I felt so guilty and scared of what Patrick would do if he found out. Anthony left without saying sorry after saying he wanted to do it again. I was upset, but I was able to calm down before Patrick got home, and I was able to hide my sadness as we talked the rest of the night. Patrick was furious and kept reading over the day's report, focusing on the Anthony incident each time but he didn't answer anyway. November 17. I'm wrestling with something that's not clear to me. Anthony has a bigger effect on me than I thought. I don't know if it's his behavior or the fact that I'm weak around him, but I feel helpless. I talked to him about our last meeting this afternoon, 
making it clear that our relationship wasn't proper given my marital status and job. Even though I was forceful, he invited me to sit with him on the couch. It's beyond me to rationalize why I agreed. We've crossed a dangerous line, and I can't decide if I want to fire him or explain what we did. I can never tell Patrick what I've been up to, and I'm glad our secrets stay hidden in the quiet of my office. I'm hoping to calm down before going home. Concerned about how things were getting worse, Patrick decided to read all of Glenda's notes in order to understand her better. After reading two pages again, he looked up and saw that it was already 2 a.m. He knew there were many more pages to read, but he couldn't put the book down. He told everyone at work that he would not be available the next day because of personal issues. Without a doubt, his life had changed forever. Love and hopes were gone, replaced by a deep sense of sadness and growing anger. He drank the last soda in the bathroom of the living room, but the caffeine didn't make him feel any better. His mind was racing as he thought about what he had read. Looking at his watch, he was amazed that he had just talked to Glenda eight hours before. His fears had not yet come to the surface. November 22nd, Anthony stopped by the office today, but I kept my distance by putting the desk in front of us. He didn't break in or try to lock the door, which was the right thing to do. I made it clearer to him that I was determined to set limits, and I hope to keep them in the days to come. Glenda was feeling good as the term was coming to a close. November 23rd, I told Patrick about the classes, and he's on board and has even offered to go with me. I will think about his idea because it seems like their relationship changed a lot from November 23rd to mid-December. On November 25th, Anthony came to the office and said he wanted to come to my house. When he realized that wasn't a choice, he asked Patrick where he was and suggested that they go to his house. I turned down the idea and said what I already said. Even though he kept trying, he acted like he normally would have, showing interest in the seminars even though they were only for teachers. November 30, 2018, yesterday was a hard day for me to remember. I have no idea what to do. I could not fall asleep, and Patrick could tell I was upset. I answered the phone. Anthony comes back to me in my dreams, even though I don't like him. The memories of the times we met bother me and make me wonder why I can't resist. He locked the door, and I couldn't say anything to stop him. Every thought in my head begged me to stop. After he left, I was so sad that tears ran down my face as I got dressed. I was stuck in my office all day thinking about therapy and having a hard time with my feelings. Glenda seemed to feel bad about what she did, but I didn't act like her normally. His mood got darker as he read more of her journal, which scared people who knew him well. December 3rd, Anthony stopped me in the hallway this morning and asked me not to meet him at his shared house. I flatly refused, pointing out the danger to my marriage and job, even though he wanted to be close to me in a real bed. Not giving up, he suggested going with me to the seminars in January and even offered to pay for his own travel if I stayed the nights with him. There was an idea that kept coming to mind. I thought about how weak I was. Patrick took a break to calm down because he was furious. He fought the urge to drink and instead focused on getting clear. Even though he knew what he needed to do next, he knew he needed a strong plan. He picked up reading his diary again when he got back to the living room. December 7th, Anthony came by my office for a short time to say goodbye before his trip home for Christmas after his test tomorrow. When he asked if I could come back early for the class, I told him to call me back in a few days. December 8th, today, I lied to Patrick to get him to stay home while I went to a conference by telling him about a cruise I was going on as a distraction. He finally gave in, even though he didn't want to. I feel bad about lying to him. Even though I haven't decided to take Anthony yet, I'm thinking about it after our last meeting in my office. I'm happy with Patrick, but for some reason I can't shake the thought that Anthony might value his experience. While I wait for his call, I think about whether he'll keep trying or give up. December 12th, Anthony called to say again that he wanted to come to Columbus with me. He suggested I book rooms next to each other and pretend he was my brother. He is going to confirm tomorrow and pay for the room. Now I have to decide if I want to betray Patrick on purpose. The 14th of December, Anthony sent me a note about our planned stay at the Sheraton. I made the reservation unwillingly because I felt bad about it. He is going next spring, when he is no longer a TA. I hope I can stay strong against more temptation. There's something about Anthony that interests me more than anyone else. If Patrick found out about this, I think it would break his heart. December 28, yesterday, Anthony called me at home using a nickname in case Patrick picked up. He also told us with excitement about our plans for New Year's Eve. It was my hope that this meeting would finally end our affair. Since Patrick had to work, I was able to plan the trip. 
Even though I had never spent two nights in a row with the same guy before I married Patrick, I agreed to Anthony's plan. I hoped that it would make me feel bad. Patrick grabbed the time and quickly looked it over. There were almost five hours of sleep left. After almost finishing Glenda's diaries, he was set on reading them all, even though he knew she hadn't lied. He needed to know for sure. He chose to have coffee instead of reading the last page. He had time to rest later. January 3rd, the big day is tomorrow. My trip includes three days of workshops and nights with Anthony. I'll drive him to his destination and then drop him off again. Lucky for us, Patrick didn't make us join. To make sure I get there, I got a map. I went to a nearby Victoria's Secret to buy clothes for Anthony and me to wear together. I don't like it, but I'm going to wash them before I see Patrick. I'm surprised at how excited I am, but I worry about Anthony because he wants new things. I'll wait to try anything new until our cruise, which I'll call a journey. I've started packing so Patrick won't figure out what's going on. Knowing what I'm thinking makes me wonder if I can do it. Whatever happened in my office was unplanned, but this trip would be planned. I could refuse and pay for Anthony's costs, but the thought of it makes me excited. After finishing his seventh book, Patrick thought about everything he had read over the last nine hours. Thinking he was done with his marriage, he started making plans for the next three days. Even though Glenda broke her promise to Anthony, trust was broken. It seemed impossible for him to forgive her as his love for her faded and his anger toward Anthony grew. Before noon, he used his computer to call a number. What can I do to help Pearsall Investigations? When the woman replied, her professional voice made him feel better. Saying that it met his wants. The answer is yes if you mean looking into cheating husbands. Do you want to talk to a police officer? The way she answered put him at ease. Yes, please. Christopher said, I'm interested in your services. After a short wait, a man's voice answered. Our name is John Pearsall. How can I be of help? Patrick didn't take long to describe what was going on. I think my wife is seeing someone at the Sheraton Hotel near the airport while she is cheating on me. What is the matter? Patrick wasn't sure how to spell out his wish clearly. Our team is ready to take on the Sheraton. Is this going on now? What exactly is the time frame? Patrick calmed down and said, My wife is there right now and will be there until Saturday morning. She is in room 412 and the man she is with is in room 414, which are next to each other. They were there last night too, but I didn't do anything about it until this morning. I get it, she's going to workshops. Now, I need more information about how you want to be spied on. To begin, could you give me their names and descriptions? Patrick told about his wife and said he could send a picture if needed. He learned about the company online, but he would rather talk to someone in person. Besides Anthony's full name, he gave a general account from his wife's diary. There's no mystery, Mr. Dunn. If you only need pictures and don't need to keep an eye on them all the time, we can put cams in their rooms this afternoon. The cost is $800 altogether. It might be less expensive to use just one camera. All I need is proof that they were together. If they stayed overnight, I'd rather check tonight and get the pictures by tomorrow evening. Since we don't know which room they'll use, we'll need cams in both. The price we charge includes good equipment and access fees. Hiring a maintenance worker for two posts. I'll pay on your website with a credit card right away. Awesome. Note the case number 1372A on the form as you fill it out. After you pay, I'll set up the cameras and give you a DVD with the video. For delivery, please give your name and address. Patrick found the process to be easy, but getting the DVD in the mail wasn't a good idea. Could you put the DVD away until I get there? I need pictures right now that show them together. Patrick gave his number and paid his bill with a credit card over the phone. The detective confirmed that the payment had been made and started setting up the cameras. After making the deal, Patrick finally gave in to his lack of sleep. He picked up reading Glenda's diaries again right away after a short break and a quick meal. He didn't reread or think too much while he was reading. Just before 10 p.m., Glenda called as he ended the first book. The talk seemed surprisingly easy, and both he and Glenda had no trouble hiding their true goals. It was easy for him to move forward once he had his plans in place. He still didn't know if he would ever feel normal again. He checked his layouts one more time before starting the second volume. Friday had more work to do, like going to the bank to take care of money issues. He quit his job at Anderson Electric and was now waiting for his last paycheck. It was later than 1 a.m. when Anthony did not leave. He felt very tired, 
so he laid down on the couch to rest. Surprisingly, he fell asleep and felt better when he woke up at 7 a.m. After a quick breakfast, he went back to reading and began the third book all over again. He finished the third and fourth books by noon and put the diaries down to work on his list. Anderson Electric was the first place he went to get his last paycheck and clean out his locker. Having said goodbye, he hoped to see him again someday. He had to wait in line for paperwork at the bank, but he finally left with a bag full of over $20,000 taken out of joint and personal accounts. Even though he wanted more, he could only get cash right away without Glinda's approval. He checked his answering machine when he got home around 4 p.m. and saw a message from Pearsall Investigations. After calming down, he called John Pearsall's direct line. Hey, this is John Pearsall. How can I be of help? Greetings, my name is Patrick Dunn. Were you able to set up the cameras? What did you find? Absolutely, Mr. Dunn. We put cameras in both rooms yesterday afternoon, and today we got the footage. Both rooms were empty while the surgery was done, so it went quickly. After a short pause, Patrick asked, did the video show anything important? I checked the room and done sexual things more than once. The video has been put on a DVD, and I can email you three frames if you still want them. Patrick was shocked when John's words made him cry. No matter what he had read, seeing the proof made it clear that what was happening was real. Thanks for sending the shots. Regards, Mr. Pearsall. If your money problems are over, your voice sounds different today. Situations like this can be very painful emotionally, and John said, I'm worried when he heard a hint of worry in Patrick's voice. No worries, thanks. Patrick answered, I'll get in touch if I need anything else. He was calm, but there was a clear hint of worry in his voice. Your lawyer may need a copy of the DVD unless you pursue grounds. John mentioned that, while not my area of expertise, a supportive therapist can make a big difference. Thanks, Mr. Pearsall, for your help. Dealing with this is in my plans. Thank you for being so professional, Patrick said, stopping the call before it could go any further. Keeping a serious face, he stayed at the kitchen table until the sound of an email came in. After quietly looking at each of the three pictures attached, he sent them all right away to the printer that was loaded with 8x10 photo paper. Within seconds, he had physical proof that his wife had an affair. There were no explicit acts in any of the pictures, but the one of them lying together under a sheet worried him the most. For Patrick, it was a turning point in his feelings. Patrick put the pictures on the kitchen table after one last look. He went back to his chair and started reading the fifth book again. His work on the last two volumes of Glenda's diaries was finished just before midnight. Patrick noticed how closely Glenda had stuck to his ideas about her when he thought about what was written. There weren't many shocks, but the diaries did reveal a lot about their past and showed parts of their relationship that hadn't been seen before. He learned that Glenda had loved him for a very long time. But her deep love for him confused Patrick, which made what she did with Anthony even stranger. Only the fact that they didn't meet by chance at a birthday party was revealed. The meeting was planned by Glenda, who was excited about the chance to see him again. After reading both books for a long time, Patrick noticed that Glenda hadn't called and he was hungry. That night, he was even more restless because of Glenda's choice or because he couldn't stop picturing her and Anthony whenever he closed his eyes. At seven in the morning, Patrick gave up on trying to sleep and got up to start the day he had carefully planned. He decided to get up early because he had a lot to do. By 8.30 a.m., he had called his brother Samuel, who was the only close cousin still alive. They weren't completely cut off, in fact, Samuel, Mary, and their kids Sam and Brenda had just visited two weeks before. Samuel was surprised when Patrick showed up out of the blue in the morning, but Patrick's brother and family were free. Patrick didn't get to his brother's house until just after 10 a.m., after keeping himself busy. He saw that the kids were eager to get back to work, so he called them into the kitchen. At the table, Patrick and Samuel waited for Mary to make fresh coffee. Patrick remembered the family's visit when he thought about their recent Christmas get-together. To their surprise, he gave each child a crisp $100 bill, which led to tears of thanks and warm hugs. Samuel told Patrick, you didn't have to do that, but it was nice of you to see them so happy. In what shape are you? Win a lot of money in the lottery? Patrick smiled a little. Unfortunately, not that lucky. It's not worth bragging about how rich I am. I was just in the mood to be kind. At the kitchen table, they sat down together with coffee and talked about nothing important. Mary said, I guess I can stop avoiding the subject of your big plans with Glenda. She talked about how you want to start a family. You'll love being a parent just as much as we do. Patrick didn't answer right away. 
she told you that, huh? There doesn't seem to be much that women hold back. Patrick changed the subject and asked his brother about his job as a restaurant manager before Mary could say anything. When they were done drinking their coffee, Patrick got up to leave. The next time I see you will be Christmas 2020. Do not lose focus. They quickly shook hands and he gave Mary a quick hug. I am thinking about you. He left with those words and said goodbye as he got to his car. Samuel turned to Mary as he watched Patrick leave. Are you curious about what's bothering him? He looked busy and wasn't interested in talking. Mary just shrugged and seemed indifferent. She was probably just passing the time until Glenda got back from her course. They went back to their house and talked about what they were going to do the rest of the day. When Glenda Dunn got home just before 6 o'clock at night, she noticed that Patrick wasn't there because she was coming in through the kitchen. She had planned for them to meet up again, but his absence made her feel awkward. She thought of it as a chance to move and do laundry, though. As she walked past the kitchen table to think about taking another shower, she saw a note stuck to a salt shaker that was signed by an unhappy Patrick. The note gave her permission to go ahead with her plans. She then went upstairs and chose to take a bath instead of a shower to rest. She found her notebook on the dresser while she was doing the laundry. When she remembered putting her journal in her emergency bag, she went back and got it, glad to see that it was still there. She meant to update it while she was away, but she forgot until Patrick found his phone in the wicker basket. She sighed when she got it back and realized that her question was just rhetorical. When she got back to the table, she used a key from her wallet to open her notebook and started writing on the first blank page. The most exciting four days of my life ended on January 7th, and I need to write down everything, even if it's bad. I felt better as we got farther from the city. He rushed to join me at Victoria's Secret in the mall and helped me choose things I bought. One of the sets I wore for him on Wednesday night was thrown away before I left the store this morning. I've also chosen to throw away the other sets because I don't want to remember my time at the Sheraton. Although I can't get rid of the memories, I'm going to try to move on. Wednesday night, Anthony came to my room, and we got into bed right away. From then on, I knew the huge difference between wanting something physically and loving someone deeply. Anthony didn't like that I broke up with him. He got angry, even though I tried to avoid a fight. After agreeing to think about it, I began to think of ways to make things right with Patrick. Anthony didn't care that I didn't want to sleep with weak women like me on Friday morning. It felt good not to fight with him, but I felt bad that I fell for his trick. I was afraid of the ride home with Anthony, but it went really well. I had power over how we talked when I saw him for who he really was. He was decent, and he agreed with my choice to break up. While we were driving, I decided I was going to see a therapist to figure out why I was so open to him and get over it. I am determined to never again hurt Patrick. I wish he would find out the truth. I've also chosen to stop using birth control and be open to the idea of having kids. Glenda finished writing a long note in her journal. She used the pen as a bookmark, put the book down on the table, and went upstairs to get ready for a bath. She filled the tub to the right level, added bath oil, and lit some candles before easing herself into the warm water. She brought the cell phone with her in case Patrick called. To calm down, she closed her eyes because she knew someone was watching her. While being careful, she looked around the bedroom and saw that no one was there. As she relaxed again, she thought about how to make things right with Patrick after her bad relationship with Anthony. She went back to the kitchen an hour later, feeling refreshed. After putting the clothes in the dryer, she went back to the table to read her diary entry again. She thought for a moment that she had left the pen in the book, but then she saw it on the kitchen table and opened her notebook to read it again. Glenda got up on Sunday morning feeling refreshed and ready to start a new part of her life. After cleaning all morning, she took a shower and put on an outfit she knew Patrick would like. By the middle of the afternoon, she was sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee, watching a big roast cook in the oven. Suddenly, there was a knock on the side door. Being surprised, she became scared when she saw two big men outside. One had his gun holstered and was holding on to it. The other one was a little older and wore a suit and coat. They had a police ID with them. This is Officer Reynolds from the Springfield Police Department. My name is Detective Rankin. Patrick Dunn needs to be found. Does he have a house? As Glenda told them that Patrick was at work at the moment, her face lit up with relief. When I saw you, I felt bad. My name is Mary and I'm his wife. While you wait here, I might be able to help you. Glenda said hello and stepped back to let them in. She said, sure, come on in, and led them into the kitchen. Why do you need to find Patrick? 
she asked, her face showing a hint of worry again. He doesn't seem hurt, does he? She added with worry. Detective Rankin quickly put her mind at ease. This is not what I meant at all. From what we know, your husband is fine. All we have to do is talk to him and get the note Patrick left and give it to the officer. His letter is available for you to read. When I got back from my trip last night, it was still there. Officer Reynolds stood at the bar with his hand still on his gun to keep an eye on the back door to the kitchen. After reading the note, he gave it back to the police officer. Please let me keep this, Mrs. Dunn. Following Glenda's no response, the agent put the note in his briefcase. Why do you need to talk to Patrick, she asked. Why would the cops be interested in him? He hasn't had any problems. The cop answered, we got a call about a murder this morning. The call came from your husband's smartphone. We're talking to his handler to find out where he was at the time. With relief, Glenda stood up. Someone must have mistaken you. My husband's cell phone was here when I got home from work last night and tried to call him. It was remaining on the desk. Unfortunately, Mrs. Dunn, I don't see any cell phones around here. Are you sure you didn't get the time wrong? It may not have happened yesterday. The fact that Glenda looked shocked proved that the basket was empty. She looked around in shock, even though it was clear that there was nothing else on the bar. Not understanding. His phone was here when I tried to call him last night, she told the detective, showing anger and worry on her part. Unfortunately, Mrs. Dunn, I can't tell you why the phone isn't where you say it should be. The officer wrote in his folder, it looks like the call that was traced to your husband's cell phone was made from it. Does your husband know Anthony Romano? Glenda was shocked when the name was mentioned, and for a moment her face turned pale. My husband does not know Anthony Romano, but I do. Since Anthony worked for me last term, your husband had no reason to dislike Mr. Romano. Are you certain that he didn't know him? Glenda became more scared as she answered, no, Patrick has never met Anthony. The detective looked at her again after taking a few more notes. His words were, well, it looks like your husband knew Mr. Romano well enough to make the call reporting him eliminated. She sat down at the table and yelled, Anthony is dead. Glenda was shocked. The officer sat down next to her and asked, what was your connection to Mr. Romano? There may have been a reason for your husband to be involved. Glenda's face turned pale as the officer talked. After a moment of calm, she said, Anthony was just a high school student. My husband or my helper would have no reason to hurt him. As strong as her words were, her tone didn't show it. The detective allowed her to think about what had happened before telling her husband, we found evidence of an attack on Mr. Romano as he entered his home. In the hallway, there was a travel bag and tracks that showed someone had been fighting. The detective said that Mr. Romano lost the fight and was dragged to the kitchen, or he was tied to a chair with nylon straps that are usually used for electrical lines. There were soft tears from Blenda. Her vessel was hit because she lost a lot of blood. Even though the autopsy results have not come back yet, it looks like Mr. Romano took a lot of hits before he died from a single gunshot to the head, the officer said. According to early pathological evidence, he was also shot in the groin after the fact, but the wound did not kill him. The death was likely between 6 and 8 o'clock last night. Glenda stepped in and said that Patrick could never do something like that. The detective looked over his notes for a moment before moving on. The state says that your husband has a permit for a .25 caliber semi-automatic gun. This size bullet was found in the chair, which is a first hint that it came from his gun. The motivation is still not clear. Detective Rankin looked through his folder and finally found three copies. He put them on the table in front of Glenda. Three photos were found at the crime scene and these are copies of them. By being close to Mr. Romano, they are killing him. The blood spray shows that they were there when the fatal shot was fired. The officer told her, I don't think you've been completely honest about your relationship with Anthony Romano or your husband's relationship with him. After taking the copies, Glenda's face changed into a shocked look as she looked at them. As the truth set in, she broke down in tears and insisted that Patrick couldn't have known. The detective got ready for a three-minute call, but he didn't say much and kept writing in his pad. Glenda's crying stopped, and she was left to sit quietly with her hands over her face and tears running down her cheeks. When the agent was done with his notes, he looked up at Glenda and told her that her husband's call had been tracked to Windsor, Ontario. Local police and a cell phone company worked together to find his phone, but neither he nor his car were seen. However, license plates that fit his car were found in the trash. They think he may have switched plates to look like he was driving in Ontario. Glenda stayed at her desk and cried uncontrollably while hearing the news. 
The detective watched her for a while and then took out another copy from his folder and gave it to her. It showed a ruler and a small brass key. The pictures had a key in them, but it's not clear what it means. Glenda quickly got her bag back. Right away, she pulled out a key that matched from her pocket and put it next to the picture. She lost control right then and fell back in her chair. Diary and Patrick were the only things she said. The two guys waited with her for about 15 minutes while she calmed down. In the end, they got her to call someone for help. They left after making sure her sister would get there on time. The officer kept talking about how well he can avoid being caught. Canada's cops may not put a high priority on his search because he hasn't done anything wrong there in two weeks. He doesn't kill people all the time. If he stays hidden, his chances of being caught get smaller over time. The officer said that if he is still on the run after six months, they might try getting more attention on TV through most wanted shows, which have worked in the past. Before continuing, Officer Reynolds took a moment to check his phone. The thing she said about it being there last night seemed real. I totally agree. I do not believe she was lying or wrong. It seems likely that he came back but didn't follow through with his plan. It's likely that he saw my smartphone and chose to take it. The police officer looked confused. He should have told her if he was here, though. He wouldn't normally come back just for the cell phone. Detective Rankin stopped. I can only think of one reason he'd come back, to kill her and maybe himself. I don't know what made him change his mind, but I don't think he just came back for his phone. Reynolds gave the detective's words some thought and nodded. He said at some point, I think Mrs. Dunn will realize how close she was to dying and wonder why she didn't. I'm interested in her reaction.